Here we are on a Sunday session. Gotta love a Sunday session. I'm not on the urn. I told you. I'm on a little landlock. Landlocked lock. Try saying that four times when you're pissed. Three rods out. I can't really be I can't really fish four rods here. If I walk that direction it shallows up, so there's like a deep gully here. I'm fishing kind of in the gully, at the gully and at the gully, so I'm kind of fishing at the one in the middle. Behind me there's a river that flows into this lock, so basically that river has carved a like a like a, a channel into the lock. So basically you're fishing the river channel. Weather-wise, it is nowhere near as bad as yesterday. So let's see what today brings, eh? Got the uh, kettle on. We cup of coffee time. Rods are out. Brolly's up. And no sooner than I put the brolly up than it starts to rain. But the good thing about today is the rain isn't coming with 50 mile an hour plus winds. So we're all good. There must have been some waves crashing along the shore because the debris it, the debris is thrown, you know, <laughs> it's thrown a good a good six feet up the bank. Oh, here we go, we've got the kettles piping at me, that means it's that means it's time for a cup of coffee. That's the beautiful thing about the Coleman stoves. You get them all serviced so they're running nice and sweet. And you'll have hot water in a flash. I was looking at some of those other stoves. There was a guy who suggested one. I forgot the name of it. But it has its own fuel bottle and you prime the fuel bottle and it's... And to be fair, it looked like a good stove. But the price tag can I put it out of my reach. I have a roach, perch and a big half mackerel on the go today. I managed to secure some uh, big smelt, which is great. Because nice uh, smelt, big smelt, I would class smelt uh, 9 to 10, maybe 11 inches as turbo smelt, big big smelt. So I got my local tackle shop, fishing tackle and bait and a skill to order me in as much as they could get. I think in the end I got 15 packets of turbo smelt from them plus a load of other baits and other stuff. Fishing tackle and bait are my is what I would class as one of my local uh, angling shops. Pike fishing stuff is brilliant in there. For the match fishing stuff, it's amazing. You know, it's one of those shops where you can go in. The people that own it, dead easy to talk to. Say you want something ordered from like Fox or Nash or whoever, just to have a look at it, they'll actually order it in for you. Like when I got this chair. I made the choice between this, this is the Fox uh, Recliner Deluxe, between this and the Daddy Long Legs Nash one. And they got they got them in and I was fit to go, okay, I like the, I liked the Fox one because it was a kilo and a half lighter. So I went with the Fox one. But it was one of those, it's one of those places like my avid uh, on Hook and Cradle. I asked David who owns the place if he could order it in so I could have a look at it and he's like, yeah, no worries at all. A week later it was ordered and came into the shop. 
And I went down, looked at it, and thought, this is the job. What else? What they will do as well. This is why they're one of my favourite shops. Say you see it on the internet, and it's less than what you see at the shop. It matched the price. So why would you shop, you know, far away when you can go to a local shop and say, this is what I want. Here it is on the internet at this price. Can you sort it out for me? Yeah, and it's there. As much as I like buying, you know, good quality fishing gear, you know, at a cheap price, I think it's sad that we're losing all the little tackle shops up and down the country. Eventually, you know, the likes of comp likes of big companies like Eric Anglin and stuff like that seem to kind of take over. I find that's a little bit sad. I like the little independent shops. Like when I was based at Conningsby in Lincolnshire, there was one in Boston. It was great because you could walk in and ask the guy behind the counter, you know, where's fishing, blah blah blah, and he would be fit to go, you know, go down, try this place, take this bait, this is what's working in the match circuit. Cracking place, but I hear it's gone. It's been years since I was in Boston. Boston, Lincolnshire, not Boston, America. Today's breakfast. We're not doing chicken Maryland. It can piss off. I'm gonna go back to doing a nice simple bacon roll. Or bap or sandwich or whatever else people call a bacon butty. I dropped one of my drop arms last time I was out fishing and ended up stepping on it. So I ended up breaking the little tension and screw. I thought just my fucking luck. But I spoke with uh, Pete who makes them and he was like, yeah, yeah, we'll get your spares sent out. See, good people doing good things. This is why I will happily recommend good people doing good things. That offer is still outstanding that if you use the code DSAA you get free postage on anything you order from Peep for the drop arms. I'm not going to say they're the best drop arms I've ever used but they're the best drop arms I've ever used. Without a doubt. He's even turned around and managed to make a counterweight. Because if you think the drop arm, like, I fish distances, I fish with big leads, I fish with big bits. So I want my drop arm head to be heavy. So that it pulls all the tension out of the line. And that way you get your, line, your, your rod, drop arm, and your lead weight. From that, from your rod to the lead, I want it to be like a bowstring. I want it to be so tight. I want no slack in it. So when the pike picks up your bit, it's registering straight away in your drop arm. I cannot express how important it is to have your your bite indication set up so that when the pike picks up the bait, the drop arm goes. Well, say you're fishing for something like eels or sander or something like that. That drop arm might be a bit too heavy for you. So Pete developed. Uh, little counterweights that screw onto the back of the drop arm that lighten up the head so it takes away the weight of the head so if it was like an eel picking up a big bunch of worms it'll feel no resistance. If you think drop arms and bite indication for pike are you know sensitive and stuff like that there and really really important you go and fish for eels you need to have stuff that is so sensitive because the slightest little second too long and that eel will have that bit in its stomach. They're incredibly uh, quick to swallow bit eels. I don't really fish for them. You know, any that I catch are like byproduct that I caught when I'm fishing for roach or bream. They're not something I deliberately target. Mainly because they're a pain in the arse to unhook. 
I can remember fishing a small lake outside of Oma called Moorlock. I can name it because it's it's wasted now, there's nothing on it. People that came to our country uh, destroyed it. Which is very sad because at one point, you know, there was a group of local anglers that were stocking it with bream and with, you know, to instead of having to go to, to Enniskillen to fish for bream, you could go to a little pond outside Oma and fish for bream. But, again, this is back in the early 90s that was happening, but it's, it's all it's wasted now, so there's, there's nothing on it. And I can remember catching, uh, or throwing a small roach. And I had dyed it blue, bright blue, blue food colouring. I then threw it out, and I caught this eel. <laughs> and it was, it was, it was uh, thankfully hooked with the bottom treble and the side of the head. But we weighed it, and it was just under, just under four pound. It was uh, trying to get it out of the net, trying to get it unhooked. I didn't realise that eels bite. But yeah, they do. <laughs> I don't like fishing for them. Don't like catching them. But it's important if you do catch them, you put them back in alive. <sighs> Shaping up to be a good day. I've had to use the barrow to get me down here today. I use the uh, Carp Porter Prestige, it's the uh, the big boy Carp Porter, or the fat boy Carp Porter, whatever you want to call it. Three wheeled barrow. You can load it up with all the kit and you just push it along. My back's wrecked, after destroyed. So trying to carry stuff isn't happening at all. But where, you, where I'm fishing here, load up the barrow, push the barrow along the road to the gate, to the field, open the gate, close the gate, get in, you park up, you know, just in the car park down the road there. There is usually sheep in this field, but there is no sheep in it today. But, apart from that, I'm looking forward to uh, spending a day here, relaxing. Just need some pike to show you. I got asked a few questions about the different wires, the different trace wires I use. Most of the time I'm making traces, I'm using my bog standard bleeding leader. Excuse me. The bleeding leader is basically seven little strands of wire twisted together to make one strand of wire. It's then coated in red plastic. Bleeding leader. Uh, people sometimes don't like using red. They think that maybe the fish can see the red and it kind of puts them off. Personally, doesn't matter. The pike don't care. Pike aren't leader shy. They just see the bait and their brain is straight to I must eat the bait mode. But if you don't want bleeding leader, AFW do another make another type of wire called surflon. The only difference between this and this, obviously this is brown, this is red, and this is slightly softer. It's slightly softer because whereas this is one strand of wire made out of seven little strands of wire, this is one strand of wire made out of 19 little strands of wire. So this is more supple than this. Now do I use this? Yes. Where do I use it? Uh, uh, pretty much everywhere I use this. It literally is what trace I pick out of the wallet. I have a load of traces made up with this, a load of traces made up with this. If you were fishing, I fished a place in England where you could get live rainbow trout from the fishery. Which was great because I used this in 60 pound for my up trace. So it's stiff, it, keep the, it keeps the, the, the uh, the float and the tackle away from the, 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 the bait trace and then I use this for the bait trace 
Again, well at the time it was £45, this is labelled as 46 For the sake of a pound it's not going to make a difference. But when you're using like a live bait, this was, get, this was good because it gave the live bait a bit more room. You can use this stuff if you're live baiting. Um, it doesn't really make a difference in most occasions. But if you're wanting something that's a little bit softer, just a little bit more delicate, then the surf lawn is for you. I mean, AFW, American, that's a, it's a short for American Fishing Wire. You know, tried and trusted, bomb proof wires, and I have no problem in recommending them to, to anybody out there that wants to use them. <coughs> uh, again, all these wires and all the crimps and the bits and pieces that, that you get for them, I get them off Eddie Turner. You know, so it's. If you're unsure about why you would use a softer trace, then ask me in the comments below and I'll happily explain why you would use a softer trace. Uh, but like I say, do I open up a bit wallet and pick, you know, either or of these? Uh, usually I open up the bit wallet and I'm in a bit of a hurry to get a bit in because when I arrive at a place, I just want to get bits and then I'll set everything else up. So literally is, you know, that one, that one, that one. It do doesn't matter, doesn't care. At the minute I'm fishing with two titanium traces that I got from Gata Bits. I've been testing them for a couple of years. I've had the same trace for three years now. And the only thing I've had to do different to it is, is hooks. So it's lasted three years. So testament to the Gata Bits titanium traces. But it's, it's for, for me, traces, they're the most important asset of your fishing. You have to make sure that they are rock solid. That means that you've got to test them when you make them. If you make a trace, and if you can put it between two little grips or hold it between two pliers, and you give it a good good lock, good, pull, good pull, then you know it's strong, it's going to last. If you prefer it to pull it, and it, tang, it, it, it breaks, then you're doing something wrong. You're not doing something correct. Uh, I've went through a number, a number of videos and explained how I make traces, so I'm not going to do that today. But making a trace is, for me, it's I kind of go above and beyond. That's why I use a choke knot, that's why I use crimp. You know, so the knot itself, if you pull it, it'll get tighter, it strangles itself out. You know, you want something that you know that you can trust. It's just the way it is. I mean, anything I'm throwing, with bait attached, I know I can trust it. But like I said, if you've got specific questions about trace wires and different, uh, you know, why I use 45s and 60 pound brick and strains and blah blah blah, then then give me a shout in the comments below and I'll, I'll get back to you. Just then. I might be into a run here. Shit in the trees. No, I think I've dropped it. I think it's dropped it. Or it is very, very small. No. Let's just check the bit. Oh yeah, something's definitely had a fucking go at the bit. Definitely had a snap at it. Good signs, good signs. Good. Put back out, shall we?
big roach popped up, smelt, half mackerel. Ready to rock and roll today. Summer, apparently they were getting some decent bags of bream out of here, apparently. I've seen a few photographs, I can't tell what the photographs were actually in the summer or not, but I might have to come back here in the summertime and do a day's feeder fishing. The island's like a big figure of eight, but the, the lock's like a big figure of eight. So we're at the bottom of it, and the wind is just hacking into this bay. So I'm hoping that because the wind's blowing down here, all the bait fish are out here. I did go to the top of the lock, and I was looking down, seeing maybe get a drifter float on it, but just nowhere to get in to get into fish probably. So this is it. Let's just see what the day brings, eh? I've been asked some questions about the lead link that I use. Why I use mono, why I don't use a ledger stem, stuff like that. Uh, I don't use a ledger stem. I don't directly attach my lead to my main line because the places that I fish tend to be somewhat snaggy, shall we say. If I knew that I was fishing a place that was just you know, a nice clay or a mud, then maybe I would just go with a ledger stem or something like that. But a lot of places I fish, you know, you're, you, you, you might lose your lead, you know. So if your lead's attached by a swivel to your main line, well then you're going to lose your trace that's got a bit on it. And you don't want to leave baited traces in the water because then a pike will pick them up, pike will eat it. And eventually you're just going to have a, a gut full of wire that can't digest it and it dies. So I use monofilament. I use the. I'm going to show you my uh, my chosen monofilament. It's nothing special. You buy a bulk spool like this off eBay for a fiver. It's 12 pound breaking strain. It's it's pretty good. You can use this for shock leaders for your feeder fishing if you want to. This is, I have, I have four or five spools of this, I have 12, 10 and I have a 15. Um, the 10 I used on some float rods for carp fishing in England. Straight through, but you're catching like, you know, 12 to 18 pound carp on, you know, little wagglers and little tiny, little tiny pellets. It was good fun. It wasn't really, really carpy carp angling, but it was good fun all the same. So this is basically my ledger. Now you're going to struggle to see the monofilament but you can see, I don't know if you can see or not, that line has been knotted twice. So on one end you have your lead, you have a little clip to clip your lead to and I just put a rubber sleeve on it just to tighten or tidy everything up so everything's nice and tidy and there's less chance of a hook getting in there means there's less chance of getting tangled up. So there we go, we have, that lead, we have that little rubber sleeve over it. This is about three foot. On the other end of that, we have our run ring. These are the Catfish Pro run rings that I, that I like. I quite like these, I use these on my rods. Again, on this one, just pull the sleeve off. It's a little, little clip and run ring. Tighten the rubber sleeve up. Now say you're fishing and you've cast out and you go to wind in but you're stuck. You're rock hard stuck. Your weight is wedged, wedged behind a big boulder or a rock or a tree or root step. Either way this is anchored to the bottom and it's stuck. This is 12 pound mono. When you cast it out this takes the weight of the cast brilliantly, no issues at all. But you're stuck, you're stuck on the bottom. 
Well, because your main line is 20 pound, or in the suffix advance case, I think we had 0 0.40 millimeters as something like 35 pound Brickenstein. You know, so really, really good main lines, even if you're using braided lines. I mean, you're using a 50 pound breaking instead of a braid like Power Pro. So you'd have this lead anchored in the bottom, and because you tie little knots in it, this is what happens. You give the rod a good pull, and it snaps. Nice and easy like that. It snaps at the knot. Your rod is more than capable of emitting enough pressure to break your lead link. So what happens now? Well, you get this back, which is good because these cost a fiver for three of them. You lose this, hey ho, we lose leads, we don't mind. But then you tie on another another lead link and you cast out. The main thing is that you're not leaving uh, baited traces on the ground if you snag up. Why do I use it? Uh, it's like three to four feet long. I don't know. That's just always been my preference. So I like a longer lead, longer lead link. So that the lead can get, you know, if it's a fishing on a river, you know, I do favour these sort of grip leads. If I'm on a river, you want something that digs into the bottom and doesn't move. So it's just a case of, you know, horses for courses, whatever you fancy. I mean, some people, you, you know, this will be completely alien to some people. They'll be like, no, I'm using a leisure stem and that's it. That's fine. You know, use what you want. It's your fishing at the end of the day. I'm only saying to you, this is what I do. So... You know, you can tick it or tick it or leave it if you want, guys. So there we have it, my ledger link. Why I use uh, a long line le or a long ledger link or rotten bottom or lead link or whatever you want to call it. But it's basically designed so that you can sacrifice your lead but get your baited tris back. Another news, it's just gone 10 o'clock. That means a bit of a 10 o'clock tea break and then get some bacon sandwiches on the go. <sighs> Sunday morning bacon sandwiches by the, by the lock. Life is good. Back for another exciting edition of cooking with scobes. Just having a bacon sandwich today. Just put a little bit of oil in the pan. Not an awful lot, you don't need millions of, you don't need tons of it, you just need a little bit. Oh, get that on there. And we're back using the, uh, the Kennedy back bacon. Only the finest, only the finest. We normally have five slices, but we've got six this time, so we're doing well. We've, we've won an extra slice. But I'm cooking it because I want to fold it into a bap. Take your little slack, your little little thin end. Place it in first, then fold the uh, the other bit over it. That way you're cooking all the. You're trying to make it as compact as possible because it's only a small pan. You don't really have the, the space in the pan to get the rashers out. Now I have to find my tongs. Oh, lovely! Just gone 12 o'clock, so 
It could almost technically be called lunch. But it's up to date. Uh, it's a nippy day, standing out there in the wind. Yeah, it's definitely chilly. The old wind chill factor is definitely taking a mark today. But I fry up these, then I'll see you in a minute. Heard a bit of bacon sandwich. Get another cup of coffee on the go. I'll show you a little trick I use to clean the pans. If you're fishing somewhere where there's like a sand on the on the like in the bank, handful of sand in the pan, boiling water, swizz it round. You'll find the sand scours the pan, takes all the burnt food, all the fats, everything off it, and then pour it out. It's safer than using. You know, like, uh, well, I suppose you, I used to, I would use like, you kind know, of, like a wet cloth as well, just to kind of, you know, clean it up before I put it away. But to get the stuff that's burnt onto it, a little bit of sand, a little bit of boiling water, a bit of a scrub, sorted. Just because we're out fishing doesn't mean that we have to live like barbarians now. Bacon sandwich is done. Cup of coffee, almost done. The drizzle has come into us. Not much I can do about the weather. I would have thought of it. I would have thought I might have has a. Start again, shall I? I would have thought that there would have been a fish turning up. I haven't fished this particular spot for a long time. Last time I fished here, I was probably a teenager. So it's been a long time. I stopped fishing it all those years ago because I kept I found a pike with traces in their throat in between that I, I left Northern Ireland I mean I, I left in 2000 like so it was away for you know, a long time but it was good just to get back here just to do a walk down memory lane so to speak has surprised me is the uh, the big fancy houses that have popped up out of nowhere like proper mansions when I fished this place as a kid it was it literally was rural rural Fermanagh you know sort of place where if you if you listened quietly you could hear that uh, faint rhythm of banjos in the background That sort of rural Fermanagh, where men are men and sheep are nervous, rural Fermanagh. But all these big houses seem to have appeared from nowhere. Look. Oh well, it's good if people have the cash to build them and fair play to them. Speaking of uh, big houses, I'm getting the log burning stove and the new fireplace put onto my house this weekend, or this week. My missus is the sort of person that needs to have a fire. She is one of these women that loves the heat. So, the house that has no fire like we have at the minute. She wouldn't be a fan of that. She wants a fire. So we went 
I just got a new fireplace, log burning stove, making sure that it's all connected up to the the radiators, the pipes, the heating. So it's a it's an overhaul of the heating system, which should be good. It'll mean that the house is a dual fuel house, so we can go from oil heating to the log burning stove heating. Got to keep the wife happy. Like the old saying goes, happy wife, happy life. <laughs> there isn't no uh, equivocation for the old uh, saying of happy husband, doesn't get anything. I've nearly finished the video on the review of the bait runners that I'm using. I keep getting comments, you know, like, do a review on this, do a review on that, do a review on this. Okay. <laughs> the, the bait runner reels, it'll be out sometime this week. And there's more rig videos coming, so there, you have to watch out for them. I'm going to discuss simple float rigs and float ledgering. Again, nice easy rigs, really really simple, really easy to easy for anyone to do. No stress rigs. We don't like stress. I'd like something to pick up the bait and uh, give me a run but I can't control that so I finished my brew and I'll talk to you in a minute because it was getting kind of windy I looked on eBay thinking I'm going to buy myself some 12 inch bevy pegs that way the, the, the old brawly shelter should be anchored down properly you know 12 inches of metal holding it down at a few points would be good you know I know people give uh, NGT as a company a bad rap and there are some snobs out there that would go kind of as far as to say that anyone that uses NGD, NGT tackle is a is a naughty. You know. But when it came to a pack of ten bevy pegs, twelve inch pack of ten, twelve inch bevy pegs for like eight quid NGT ones or four. Four tracker ones for twelve quid. You can call me a naughty all you want. I got the NGT ones. There's a phenomenon in amongst angling. Lots of carp anglers do this, where you will have guys that buy the latest and greatest and everything, and they're called um, tackle tarts. Tarts. There's some people that argue with me because I have uh, custom built rods for pike fishing, and that's kind of tardy. It is. But the way I seen it at that time, I had the money sitting where I could get Dave Lum to build me, you know, fishing rods. And if truth be told, I probably, I would hopefully go back to Mr. Lum and say, you know, I want another couple of them before he uh, stops making them because. As fishing rods go, you can't go wrong with the Dave Lum rods. But back to the point where we're getting guys that are, oh, you're using an NGT net. 
you're clearly a naughty. I don't understand the, uh, I don't understand the whole looking down on, on people, looking down on different anglers because they maybe don't have, you know, the best of the best gear. I don't get that. I mean, if somebody's got the fish and tackle, they're clearly, you know, if somebody's got the money to burn on fish and tackle, go nuts. Most of us don't have the disposable income to spend thousands on gear. So we have to make do with what we get, what we can get. So the next time you see somebody out there giving maybe a new angler, a novice angler, you know, stick your earache for not having the uh, the best of the best kit. Maybe kind of pull onto the one side and say, well, start a summer, mate. Don't be a tool. Oh well. But as bevy pegs go, it's a bevy peg. I don't care whether it's made by Tracker or HGT or any other make. A decent 12 inch bevy peg will hold down this brolly. Not that I want to be sitting out in 50 mile an hour winds. Hmm. Nobody wants to be doing that. Anyway, I'm going to finish smoking my cigar and then maybe have a change of bits because those bits have been soaking now for quite some time. We don't have that much light left. We have maybe another two hours of light left. So I'll give it another hour and I'll start a slow pack down. It's not been a very productive day. One run that's been dropped. But it's a new venue, or a venue I haven't fished in a long time. Somewhere different. And it's uh, better than been at work. I really should start to remember that I have to record an outro to these videos. We blanked again. The weather just got uh, worse and worse. So when it came to taking the brolly down and making an escape towards the van, it was a case of getting everything in the barrow and pushed to the van and then into the van as quick as possible because the rain by this stage was hammering down. It was interesting to go back to the venue after such a long break. I mean, like the last time I fished there, I would have been a teenager. It hasn't changed much, you know, it's still a very shallow part of the lock, or part of part of that lock. I would go back. I was, to be honest with you, when I went there yesterday, it was more so to see if there was still a public launch where you could launch a boat. It's the perfect place to launch the boat that I have once I've redone it. It's not a massive lock. It's relatively, you know, shallow you know so you don't need a, a hor mad horsepower engine i've got a four horsepower outboard that i could run that on the back of the boat and could get around you know quite comfortably in a smaller lock so that's yesterday had a dual purpose of course i was going to enjoy the fishing even if it caught nothing but it was more so a quick check out to see if there was an, a place where i could launch a boat and you know work out all the kinks once i get the boat refloored and all that stuff i enjoyed going back there like i have like i said before the last time i was there i was a teenager and the the memories of teenage scopes fishing somewhere were flooding back it it brought a few smiles as a teenager i grew up fishing with uh, three or four other people you know, we all went to school together, 
and one of the guy's uh, fathers was sort of was the he was the responsible adult. He did the driving. Here I called James. Good guy, you know, really good guy. But some of the uh, shenanigans that were pulled when we were fishing with James and Douglas and Dwayne and places people like that. We definitely had no shortage of laughs as you do when you're a, an irresponsible child. <laughs> but I won't be back out this week until the end of this week. I have access on a, I have a privileged access spot, but I don't know how much of the recording I'll be able to do for it. Hope you enjoyed the video guys. I want to say thank you to all the guys that have liked, shared, subscribed, left comments. Again, I do try to get back to all the comments, so if you left a comment, you know, give me time, I will get back to answering it. And I want to say thank you to all you guys that watched the videos. You guys definitely rock. So, until the next time, tight lines. <laughs>